chosen and took a break. We're reconvening now. Uh, we did the roll call and we did not salute the flag. So I'm going to put that into the agenda right now for public comment. So please join me. To the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you, sir. As a word of welcome, I want to wish everybody a happy new year. And isn't it nice to celebrate a new year with so much rain? Uh, just that caution, you know. I hope we don't get to flood and all of that. Uh, and interestingly enough, our statistics are still drought statistics. I was in Annadale over the weekend. There was not a creek flowing there as recent as Saturday. No water in any creek. And I was out uh, last night checking Calder and Zipper Creeks, and they were starting to run. And today it's looking better. So keep in mind that care and caution during rainy, stormy times, and also our conservation um, strategies. All right. So, as we start this evening, we have no proclamations or presentations, so we can move directly into public comment. This is an opportunity for members uh, here this evening to address the Council on items that are not on our business agenda. So, you're welcome to come to the podium. Our clerk will uh, give you a three-minute timer there, and we appreciate names and addresses for the record. It's helpful if the Council members want to Follow up with somebody to know how to reach them or where they are, who they are. I don't see anyone jumping jumping up. We have one. Thank you. You're welcome. Yeah, you be first. And it looks like you have a speaker behind you as well. Okay. Uh, my name is Jay. Jay, hi. This is my normal name. I expect you to go on about who I am more than that. But uh, I just wanted to. Uh, uh, raise the point that there's some concern about uh, the police department in, in town. Of course, there are always concerns about the police departments. And uh, we have a lot of very good cops in the police department. And yet, uh, there are some in there who have been, um, there's actually a lot of evidence of a lot of corruption in our police department in Sebastopol. And um, I myself have some evidence of actually some outrageous stuff from the production of my voice. Sounds crazy, but there is the video. And um, stealing evidence of, uh, of my um, uh, perpetrator's uh, crimes and, and by breaking into my house without a warrant, yada, yada, yada. It goes on. There's a lot of evidence, and yet the, the courts haven't received any of it because at this point, of course, they need to protect themselves because, at this point, because of Marcy's law, they would have violated six of my victim's rights and four of my civil rights if they don't continue to protect themselves and this officer. I know this is not isolated. In fact, I reported that officer uh, six years prior to four false reported. Um, it feels a bit vindictive. I just, I just wish, when I drove through Sebastopol, it didn't feel like, every time we see him, he's good. Actually, I think uh, he actually is. But when I see some of the cops or a cop car in which I don't know who's driving, I get pretty scared because I've been, uh, I know a lot of people have been actually harassed and abused by cops in Sebastopol. And I think it deserves some attention from an independent uh, investigation. Thank you. All right, thank you for those comments. Just to make sure everybody understands, we're just receiving comments. We're not getting into discussion or deliberation. We're just taking information from people, and uh, any responses would happen later outside of the meeting. Hi, Colleen, welcome. Hi, Colleen Fernald from Morley Street, and I'm not sure if he introduced himself, Jay Schaefer, um, who maybe you all know from the Tiny House Movement. He was instrumental in that um, in the early days. And he's brought some unfortunate news to your attention, and I saw him do the same at the Board of Supervisors this morning. And uh, I was grateful for our opportunity to connect, because uh, when I was in your city hall today trying to get that appointment together that I've been waiting for for over two months, and she said you would do it, uh, now Mayor Gurney, um, um, this is what the issue is. It's not just me who is suffering 
from the criminal misconduct within law enforcement in the city and other cities and the county. And that's why it's imperative that the independent law enforcement body that is being created by the county include each and every city in this county. It's impossible for there to be impartial investigation on misconduct within police forces or police forces that have to cooperate with others in this area. It's impossible for there to be impartial, unbiased. And when the consequences of this misconduct become fatal, as they are in my family's case, for you to delay so long in even getting the information impartially, it's negligence. And it's time for that to change. Now, your negligence is further in the sense of upholding your oath. All right, the way that the president wants to work around the powers of Congress with executive orders, you remain peace town in name only. Because how many instances do guns go off by themselves, and in particular kill and hurt people? How often is a gun on its own without human interaction gone off? So it's not controlling the guns, it's controlling human behavior in this country. And when you talk about mental illness, and we look at Sheriff Gelhaus and another fatal flaw that he was allowed by our district attorney, by our U.S. Attorney General, that it's now a okay for officers to kill and just say, oh, I was afraid. So this has got to change, and it won't happen on its own. We're not going to have a good new year on its own. So now that, like, the city of Santa Rosa is looking to support Mike Thompson with his gun control, I'm going, you're going to intercede with executive orders. You call on them, you, this body, to annul Public Law 107243, which enables strike first by our military abroad, by our law enforcement at home, with immunity. Strike first. So how are we going to change human behavior that we say offense is okay for some, but not all? No, we stick to defense. That's how you're peace town in name. So please, schedule this meeting with me right away, because we need to talk about the criminal behavior of Jim Letty. Before oh, right, I'm just victim. checking, you've had a little time to wrap it up, Colleen, so I Sorry, think too many issues that are overdue because we've not been meeting up. Okay. I think each council member and staff are available by email if anybody would like to contact us. If this opportunity is... I don't email, but in person. Already, is there anyone else who would like to address the council? How's everybody feeling temperature-wise? I think it's getting a little warm. On your head? Is it warm? Okay, I don't know how to work the thermostat down there. So just, just a little bit so we don't get to the too cold again. Let's just try it and see how we can do it. All right, last call for public comment. It seems like everyone who's wanted a turn has had a turn. And we'll go on. Yeah, that goes. Give me the signal if you're chilly. I don't know. Put your coat back on. I'll put my coat on. All right, so we're calling for a statement of conflict of interest by any council members for items on the agenda. Does anyone have a conflict? Seeing that, we'll move forward to uh, our first regular agenda item. This is a discussion and an action item regarding the appointments to the Public Arts Committee. Uh, these are the interviews that we just concluded before the break. So I'll double check with our city manager, city attorney, and city clerk. Is there anything else you'd like to add uh, or do you want to go through your staff report at this time? Well, as we noted earlier during the interview process, we there are presently three openings on the Public Arts Committee for terms which expired at December 31st of 2015, and you have five applicants who you have interviewed and uh, would be making appointments. Now the, point, the ordinance re suggests appointments in various categories um, and the applications you've received, the, each of the individual applicants indicated categories that they felt they were um, qualified to hold. However, as we've also noted, the way the ordinance is written, the council is free 
to appoint anyone in any category. All righty, thank you. Are there any follow-up questions to our interview process and that discussion? Council Member Eater. Well, actually, this is relative to the staff report, but not to the interview process. Um, on the second page of the staff report at the top, first paragraph, it says, the committee shall maintain a registry of public art in the city and perform the duties. Well, basically, I'm sorry. So, the registry of public art. So, is that something that remains to be done, or is that in existence and their job is to maintain it? Uh, last year, we did have an intern who prepared uh, what I would characterize as maybe a preliminary inventory, and we presented that to the Public Arts Committee, who gave us some feedback for some edits. Um, so that'll be updated on an ongoing basis. So they have, we have created a, a document that's on the, the website presently that is attempting to be a, an inventory. I think it, it needs some work and some improvement, but we've got to start on it. Okay, thank you. The reason I bring that up is, as I've stated previously a couple of times, I think some of these temporary installations in town have kind of just been left to become quasi-permanent and, and hopefully this inventory of like cutoff dates or date of installation, date of review or whatever the process is. Add, add to it. Yeah. All right. Thank you. All right. So uh, what I would recommend to us so that we do this evening is discuss the candidates and our responses to them, uh, and then see if we have some consensus as to who might be appointed, and then look for a motion for each seat. So is there a council member, uh, council member Eater, are you willing to go first? With some well, comments? I'm wondering how public comment fits into this item, or is there really a, I'm just saying, where, where does that fall into this protocol, if at all? Uh, we could do public comment, certainly. Is that required? I think it's it's welcome. It is a, reg it is a regular agenda item, so council should probably. Yeah, yeah, I just didn't want to get out in front of that. Though. All right. Um, well, let's take public comment on this. We went through the interview process. There weren't very many people who were observing that. A few. Uh, would anybody like to comment on our interviews or the applications, the staff report? Make comments to the council on. Um, the appointment process or the appoint possible appointments. So I'm seeing no one come forward, so I think we made that opportunity. And again, I appreciate the reminder that we do that. Okay, well, okay. seeing no uh, public comment, uh, are we ready for saying who we would like to put forth? And what I've asked for is comments from all of us on the council okay. as to our responses to the interviews and our preferences to see if we can have a consensus and get to some motions for this box. So we're naming names? If, you, if you're willing to, yes, yes. I would recommend okay. it. Okay. No sense in um, not. Yeah. Well, I, it was interesting. We, you know, we saw a pretty wide cross-section of people on a variety of levels. And, uh, and I found that really refreshing, and I appreciate them all throwing their hat in the ring. Um, you know, I have publicly stated previously that I think it's time to uh, lift the bar, raise the bar on public art in Sebastopol. And by saying that, I don't mean any disservice or insult to the existing Park that's in town, but I just would really like to see. I've just been so many places where there's art that just stops you in your tracks, and you can't go home without thinking about it or taking a picture or whatever. And I don't find that to be the case in a lot of instances here in Sebastopol. So I'm looking forward to this body and these people that we appoint tonight to push that forward. And um, there was a, a there was a uh, comment by one of the interviewees that they felt that the, um, this, bo this body should have some level of independence from the center of the arts. And I, I think that's laudable and I support that. Um, you know, I, I know they need to work closely together. In fact, one of the people is supposed to be a, a, you know, involved in an organization such as that. Um, and. So having said all of that, um, the three names that I would put forth is, are David Gordon, 
Warren Arnold, and Jennifer Burns. I think that they bring a diverse range of backgrounds and skills, at the risk of sounding ageist against even me, <laughs> uh, different age groups, uh, different experiential backgrounds in other places they've lived and things they've done. And I think that they'll bring to this body the, the broadest uh, background of uh, the applicant pool we have tonight. Thank you for your insights from our experience in here. Are there any other comments? Uh, Council Member Slater, Vice Mayor Glass, either of you? Uh, Some individual comments um, were made that struck me during the interviews. David Gordon said, let artists do their artist thing. And as an architect and a creative person, that's something that I really appreciate. I, when I have a client who says, oh, I don't know, do your thing. That's, those are the best jobs to me because those are the ones where, where as, as a creative person, I get to, to expand my, my thought process. So I really appreciate that. His experience as a professional artist in the public realm is, I think, unparalleled among certainly the applicants, but unparalleled, uh, I think, in a lot of, amongst the arts community in general. That, uh, the experience that he brings is tremendous. Alexis Persinger brings an architect's perspective, which I appreciate. And he's in a unique position where he is also up for, he's applied, reapplied to be on the Design Review Board. He'll be doing, taking part in the interviews that we do next Monday evening. So, of course, everybody's invited to those. The, the position that he holds now is a seat on the, on the Public Arts Committee, but it is as the representative put forward by the Design Review Board. And so what, basically what he's wanting to do is, is move into an independent seat on the Arts Committee rather than be the appointee from the Design Review Board. He, he talks about being in town and, and wanting more art in town and uh, that's, that's, of course, exactly what, what we want, all of us want. And his willingness to serve is remarkable. He's a very busy man. He owns his own business in, in town. He's a, uh, he said he came from a meeting in Kelseyville and was on his way to meet up with his family to take part in family stuff this evening. So he squeezed us in for an interview. So I really appreciate his willingness to serve. Robert Brent, his, his, work in the arts community. I think anybody who spends, who has spent any time at all in town understands his commitment to the arts and his level of uh, commitment to the Center for the Arts in, in particular. Uh, Warren Arnold, uh, remarkable experience in life, in education for 30 years, then moved into art and actually made a living as a, as a professional artist. And I really feel the, the experience that he brings to the board, he's a, he's a currently sitting member of the committee, is uh, very important. And then our final applicant, Jennifer uh, Burtz, going into the interviews, we of course get copies of the, of the applications and we review them and I, and I thought, hmm, here's somebody who's only been in town a couple of years, get us. Um, kind of weird, um, is she weird? And I, I think that in the interview, uh, I learned that she is weird. She is one of us. And <laughs> she brings a, an energy, certainly to the interview process, that we don't see very often. And we do a lot of these interviews because we have a fair number of advisory boards and we take this seriously. So it's not one member of the council gets together and talks with people and makes a recommendation like other cities. So we do a lot of interviews and when somebody with that level of energy and, and enthusiasm 
wants to volunteer to take part in the city process and improve our city, that's hard to ignore. Um, actually, it's impossible to ignore. Her experience, as she noted on her application, we didn't really speak of it during the interview, but experience with the grant process, both applying for as well as awarding. I think that we all know how valuable grants can be to communities for so many reasons, but certainly for the arts, and so I think that that is uh, a valuable thing as well. So with those comments, the three people that I would be uh, putting forward as supporting to be either appointed or reappointed would be uh, David Gordon, Warren Arnold, and Jennifer Burtz. And so that the public is aware, Mr. Brent, I felt, was an extremely strong candidate but he actually, during the interview, deferred to Mr. Arnold. They worked together on the Center for the Arts Board, and I feel comfortable with, with the involvement of one member of that board being on our public committee. So that, that is uh, my reason for, for not including Mr. Brent in my list of recommendations. And Mr. Persinger already has a seat, so that, that's, that's where I landed. I appreciate that summary. It informs uh, people here who weren't here for the interviews a little bit about all our candidates. Uh, last minute last. Well, um, thank you, Council Member Slater, for your synopsis because you put it really well, and so I don't have to repeat myself. And now we will be here. So, yes, all of that squared. Um, great folks, great applicants. Um, so my thinking is, yes, um, Mr. Persinger already has a seat. I am going to roll the dice and think that he is going to be reappointed to DRB so he can continue to keep that seat representing DRB on the Arts Committee. Um, I, I think um, in questioning all of the applicants who are already incumbents, um, they seem to feel that the committee was functioning fairly well as a unit. Um, there was a little bit of um, the, uh, explanation of that things have turned over a bit um, in the past few years. That um, One member passed away, there's been some changes in it. But it seems as though that committee is starting to really start to be cohesive and they're um, communicating well, everybody gets along well. So. My feeling is we, we should keep the institutional memory of those applicants who are incumbents. So that would mean I would support uh, uh, David Gordon and Warren Arnold, both of whom have all of these wonderful qualities um, that were already explained, plus they're already on that committee. Um, so, and then Mr. Persinger is already in the committee. So then I am faced with, Robert or Jennifer, Robert or Jennifer. And um, I've actually, um, Robert has, has, has just um, contributed so much to the arts in Sonoma County, West County, um, the, arts com um, the Arts Center, and actually art nationally. I mean, he was, I don't know how you know what a big deal he was back in the old days with uh, in the potting world, but um, he, he really is a pretty amazing guy. Um, but I, I'm also thinking he's already really involved, and he's already very active in the Center for the Arts. And, and then we got this kind of, um, this extremely energetic newcomer, um, um, Jennifer Burtz, who has had a great deal of experience um, and, and enthusiasm. Um, but a great deal of experience, as was explained in, um, in granting, grant making or the grant world, but also um, a perspective of being involved in the arts in a really big city. So I'm um, thinking that I would support um, uh, Jennifer, who would, uh, as, as taking that empty seat, um, and knowing that Robert is already so involved in our arts committee, and this is a way to get a new, a new fresh face, and I'm not going to make an ageist comment here, 
Um, <laughs> Uh, but a new, uh, a new member of our community that seems to have a great deal to add and let's bring her into the community and get her involved. So those are my thoughts. Well, I agree with what each of you has said and I don't want to take a long time myself. I'm just going to add some different points uh, to share with everybody. I think uh, Robert was really helpful to us when he yielded to Warren. Okay, because we had five interesting and very compelling candidates, I think we could choose them all and be glad for it. And also know if we didn't choose them, we would likely have ongoing work from each of them as well. Uh, and I really find it important to select Warren because he was the fellow who brought this whole notion forward. As he said many years ago, and then he looked at me and said, Sarah, you were around then. <laughs> okay. Um, so, uh, I think it's very significant that he's worked with the group in the ordinance and helped shape this to the point now where, like he was saying, he can spend some of the money that's available and do some of the work that's going to commission the worthy pieces after all this kind of setup time. So it's very important for me that Warren have that continuing responsibility. Uh, I also really enjoyed David Gordon's interview. It's important for us, I think, uh, as we learned, and Councilmember Eater helped us greatly with his question about the level of sophistication. Uh, I think we're ready now to kind of, what do people say, notch it up a, a bit here, uh, and um, maybe sort of change the face of art in town uh, so that it's not as familiar to us as it has been. You know, we're, we know Patrick Amiel, we know the Sculpture Jam, we know those pieces, and, and like it's been said, many of them have stayed in their public place perhaps longer than they were intended to. And I'm thinking um, David, with his commitment, uh, will help us get to sort of a broader and maybe deeper experience. It's quite enjoyable interviewing people because, uh, you know, in the art world, so many people say, well, it's not for me to judge or say what's sort of good taste or bad taste. Uh, and it's, it's a kind of much uh, more delightful interview, say, than planning commissioners or people who have difficult political decisions to make. Art, like David said, it's sort of controversy is part of the process. If it motivates people and gets them thinking, questioning a little out of their comfort zone, that's just what it's supposed to do. So I enjoyed hearing from each of them. Uh, I, too, like Jennifer a lot and would pick her as my third choice. Uh, we learned from Councilmember Eater's personal experience as he's seen a number of her projects up in Seattle. They're obviously very engaging. Uh, I'm looking at somebody who says she can write grants and uh, like sort of create money where there isn't any money, you know, and, and get art done without great expense. And I think that would be um, energizing for the committee as well. So what I'm hearing from the council is uh, we are all looking with gratitude to the applicants and gratitude to the people for their long service to our community and welcoming three new members. I would look for a motion to appoint David Gordon, Warren Arnold, and Jennifer Lewis. I will move that. All right, and we have a second. Second that. Any other discussion? Anybody want to make the, the last comment? No, then all those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Abstentions? That will carry unanimously. Thank you so much. Now go to work, you guys. There's a meeting tomorrow. There's a meeting tomorrow morning. <laughs> Let's make great art. <laughs> right. That's exciting. Thank you so much. Thank you. We're grateful for everybody's interest and commitment to serve. All right, so we are going to move on to uh, our consent calendar. We have three items this evening. Approval of the minutes from December 15th. Approval of a notice of completion. One project is Keating Avenue. And the second is the Sebastopol Community Cultural Center uh, contract. So I will ask, is there a council member who wants to take anything off consent? Seems like we're good. I'll ask the public, does anyone want to take a matter off consent calendar in order to discuss it? Seeing no one come forward, then I'll look for a motion to approve the consent calendar as submitted. Vice Mayor Ross. I move that we approve the consent calendar as submitted. Thank you, and a second on that. I'll second that. Thank you. All right, any other discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor say aye. 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 
Opposed abstention, that will carry unanimously. We come on to item number six. And this is an informational item. It's a discussion of an update of minute orders and reference orders from our city manager and city clerk. Which of you would like to go through this? And then I think probably each council member has a comment. Oh no, uh, the city clerk will. <laughs> just who's been keeping track of this will give you a little bit of a summary. Right. I just want to show the audience if you haven't seen this packet item, it's lengthy, double sided, reflecting the work of last year. And Madam Clerk? You just said the entire staff report, right? There. You don't think I'm that easy. <laughs> no, no. No? <coughs> We do a lot of work because our staff prepares the work in researches and gets us studied up so that we can have discussions in public that are further informed and uh, informed by the public and then all that material goes back to staff to write up. And I noticed that our pages of minutes from last year to this went up like almost a hundred pages worth of record, uh, record keeping for our meetings. So I know I greatly appreciate uh, the dedication of staff, particularly the thoroughness and professionalism <coughs> of our city clerk. Any other comments on this informational item? And we'll take public comment after you guys. I just wanted to make a quick comment about how useful this document is. So if you are wondering what we did or are thinking about a particular subject, um, you can, this is available in a PDF, right? Right. It's, but it's searchable. Right. So it's searchable. So if you want to find all the instances where we um, did something to do with parks, you could do a keyword search and find every resolution, et cetera, that had to do with parks. It's a very useful document for looking up things that we have done in the past year. And we've we had that document um, the previous year. So if you're looking at, you know, what's been going on legislatively in Sebastopol, this is your document. Any other initial comments before we open this to the public? <coughs> Questions? Well, I, I see that our actual work output has slightly decreased from 2014, so that would probably explain why we didn't get a raise this year. <laughs> uh, there's 100 more pages of minutes, so I have to only draw the conclusion we talk more about doing less. <laughs> That's a bumper sticker, I think. Yeah. Anyway. <laughs> Thanks for all your hard work on this, Mary. I appreciate it. This is a, if I have sleep issues, you know, I could keep this by the bedside. Perfect reading. Thank you. All right, any other comments? So let's see, does anyone from the public want to comment on this uh, lengthy document? This is the informational item, but if you do want to step to the podium. <coughs> see, no one come forward, then uh, we'll bring it back to the council if anyone has a last remark. I think basically we just close with gratitude. I do certainly for the work the council members do. I know in my long service, um, each council member puts in tremendous dedication and we do that with the help of our staff and our staff puts in all the hours and keeps our city running every day smoothly and keeps us operating with a very thorough record of all of it, like uh, Vice Mayor Glass said. If you need to know, this is your index. You can find out what it is. So thank you again for everything.
Okay, we're here at item seven. Uh, this will be a public hearing this evening, our first reading and introduction of an ordinance amending uh, our, I'm just gonna say for short purposes here, our landscaping rules. So we have a report uh, from our planning director and our building inspectors here as well. Do you guys wanna lead off? Very good. As I think everybody knows, there's been a serious water situation in the state of California, a drought. Um, the governor uh, directed the State Department of Water Resources to update the model water efficient landscape ordinance um, and uh, make that apply to localities. Um, and the general intent of the new regulations is to create more water conservation through uh, more efficient um, irrigation and lower use of water intensive plants. So local agencies had a couple of choices on how to implement these new regulations, um, either simply by referencing the state regulations, updating comprehensively in their own municipal code, the regulations and replicating the state rules or just um, let them take effect. We do have, um, the state did require a similar update just a few years ago, so we do have a whole section of the municipal code that um, covers this area. So our recommendation is to um, adopt these rules by reference and in the process to rescind the um, older regulations that are currently in the municipal code. Uh, there's an attachment to your staff report that highlights a few of the things that the, the new regulations do, um, such as lowering the threshold of applicability, the, the size of landscape projects that would be applicable to these rules, um, increasing the amount of mulch that you have to use, uh, and decreasing the area of landscaping that can be more high water use plants, among other things. So the regulations are relatively detailed, and um, by taking this approach, we have we'll have consistency with um, statewide rules. Um, so um, on larger projects that have professional um, landscape architects or others involved, um, they'll understand these rules. So our recommendation is that you introduce the ordinance uh, for first reading. All right, thank you. And I'll check with our building inspectors. Did you want to add anything? Are you good with that? No, I'm good. You're good? Okay. Any questions of staff? <laughs> He's a man of few words. He's good. I'm good. You're good? Questions of staff? She's good too? No, All right, yeah. This, these requirements, the, the, the urban, urban water supplier definition, is it in play in this? This is everybody in the entire state, regardless of the size of the, the water supplier business or district? I believe it is. Um, the city of Sebastopol is, yeah, there are some other regulations that kick in for what's defined as urban water suppliers, which Sebastopol is just below that threshold. Which, which for the public, that's 3,000 customers or delivering 3,000 acre feet. So probably within a few years we'll be above that threshold and um, my colleague to my right will uh, have to deal with the consequences of that. But for this, that, the purposes of this ordinance, that's irrelevant. Right. Okay, thank you. Okay, good. So I want to check with our city attorney. Is this officially a public hearing that I'm opening? Yes, it is. Okay, that's what I thought. So what I'd like to do now is open the public hearing for any comment from uh, members of our public here this evening, if you want to talk about this particular item, come on up to the microphone. Identify yourself, name, and address helps us. I'm not seeing anyone come forward. All right, so then I will close the public hearing and uh, look for any comments by council members or a motion if we're ready for that. I think it's fairly straightforward. I would like to move that we approve for first reading the introduction of the ordinance amending the changes to the Sebastopol Water Efficient Landscaping Ordinance. Thank you. Is there a second? I have second that. Thank you for a second by the vice mayor. Any further discussion? 
I think this just lines everything up and we're good and it's sort of the one easy choice and the one choice to make, so I think we're good. Any other comments? No? <laughs> okay. And then all those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Abstentions? That will carry. Thank you. Council, what I'm hoping for here is that we may be able to uh, go through item number eight. This is the discussion about the urban growth boundary and conclude that and then go on to the uh, Greenbelt issue number nine because they're kind of related and then take a break after that. If you're good, but I have no idea how long the discussion will be on the first item. Now, let's see, we have several items after that uh, and members from the consulting team here uh, and our staff, so I'm hoping we can move through things fairly efficiently. And this is item number eight, uh, the discussion of the status of our urban growth boundary and its renewal. Uh, we have information from our staff and need to provide direction from them after hearing from our public. So I will open this to our planning director, Mr. Webster, to provide a report. Yes, this is regarding the city's urban growth boundary, or UGB. In 1996, a group of local citizens qualified a ballot measure to create an urban growth boundary for Sebastopol. And what they were uh, proposing basically exactly matched the sphere of influence that had been recently, in 1994, approved in the <coughs> new general plan that was adopted in 1994. So it reflected a, a long, extensive public process conducted by the city, the outcome of that process, the UGB and the sphere matched. Um, and this was something that uh, a number of jurisdictions um, were adopting in that time period to limit sprawl and promote infill. So the, the measure, which was called Measure O, was uh, approved by the voters. Um, and it does include some exceptions in certain circumstances for um, uh, development that uh, might go outside of the UV. The measure expires at the end of 2016. So the question is what to do about that. Um, and the staff report talks about um, different options. Meanwhile, we are updating our general plan after more than uh, 20 years, um, and that process is still ongoing. We think it will, um, projecting hopefully uh, that it will be concluded in late 2016. Uh, the GPAC has created uh, uh, a draft general plan, including uh, a sphere of influence which would be quite similar to the existing sphere and therefore the UGB. They are recommending just a few small changes that um, next week when you meet with the planning commission to go over the land use element, you can look at that and uh, provide any feedback um, on uh, what the GPAC is recommending. The issue is in terms of renewing the UGB timing because the general plan process is, is ongoing, has about another year or so to go. Um, meanwhile, uh, the UGB will be expiring. Um, and if the city council puts a ballot measure um, itself on the ballot, that action is subject to the California Environmental Quality Act. The, the sphere or UGB, if it's consistent with the new general plan will be evaluated in the general plan's EIR, but that EIR will probably not be certified or approved by the city council until perhaps fall uh, of this year. So uh, in terms of the council itself putting the measure on the ballot to renew the UGB, there, there is a CEQA issue um, that comes up. So that's one option as, as far as renewal goes. Uh, is for the council to put something on the ballot, but we do have that uh, problem of the UGB. 
Another uh, option is a, a citizen initiative like what happened last time. Uh, citizen initiatives do not need to comply with CEQA, uh, so they have uh, an advantage um, in terms of that. A couple of problems with this approach. Uh, one is that we don't yet know the outcome of the general plan process. We have quite a ways to go. The Planning Commission, the City Council, May, but we don't know what the outcome of the, the whole general plan process will be or uh, what the sphere will be at the end of that process. So, um, but meanwhile, if there were to be an initiative, um, work would have to start almost immediately to get that underway. It would not reflect, unlike last time, the results of our public process for a general plan. So those are a couple of issues with that. Um, and and um, it would, this whole um, option would depend on a citizen group getting organized and understanding all the legal procedures that they would have to go through to qualify a measure to get on the ballot. And there's almost immediate work that would have to undertaken by such a group. Um, so it's somewhat challenging to, to do that. Um, if that didn't happen, um, if, um, say, a group didn't come together um, in time um, or um, felt it was appropriate to wait and not see and kind of reflect the outcome of the public process that we've been engaged in with the general plan, Another approach would be for um, the council to adopt an ordinance um, uh, this fall when probably we'll have a very good sense of what the general plan is and what the sphere is and, and can draw some lines. Um, um, and the general plan itself, of course, could contain policies that um, support the ideas reflected in Measure O in the UGB ordinance could also be passed um, by the city council to basically express policy and extend um, the idea of the UGB until such time as the general plan has been adopted and there's a suitable election coming up where um, the results could then be enacted by the voters if that's what the, the council um, wishes to do. Um, so um, those are uh, basically the, the range of, of different options. Um, we do have this significant timing issue and um, CEQA issue that create some challenges um, with how all these things come together. So what we're looking for is some initial direction. We don't necessarily have to decide anything tonight, but um, you may wish to provide some feedback to us. And I think the city manager has some additional comments. All right, let's move to the city manager then. I want to thank uh, the planning director for uh, elaborating on the staff report because we have been having some staff discussions on how to handle the UGB issues. And um, as the planning director alluded to, there are some pretty strict time requirements in terms of either a council-sponsored initiative or a citizen's initiative in terms, especially the citizen's initiative, in getting uh, the requisite number of signatures and doing the, the paperwork and getting it all together in time. I think uh, from staff's perspective, and we have uh, had some informal meetings with a group of citizens who may be willing to undertake the process to to do a citizen's initiative, we've committed as a staff to give uh, a citizen's group such uh, a support as we legally are able to do to, to the extent possible to assist them in meeting those deadlines. Because the good thing about a citizen's initiative is, number one, there's no issue, as the planning director alluded to, with the sequel process. And secondly, well, that would mean that whatever assuming it was passed by the voters, whatever was passed by the voters could not be 
undone or changed except by another vote of the people. On the other hand, it may be a big challenge, as the planning director alluded to, for a citizen group to complete that process. And as he indicated, staff is suggesting to the council that if citizens group, uh, for some reason or another, was unable to complete that process, then we believe the city council could step in in the fall and adopt um, its own UGB uh, to extend the existing UGB for a period of time and perhaps wait for the next general election so to keep costs under control. The council could theoretically extend the UGB and then could either do a, a council-sponsored initiative at an election uh, that's regularly scheduled to keep the costs down, or perhaps the citizens group could try it again. So essentially we're suggesting to you that staff work with the citizens group to try and get the citizens initiative underway to try and bring it in or help them to whatever extent possible to bring it in under the, uh, the time deadlines. And if that turned out to not be possible, ultimately then the backup position would be the council to take action in the fall to extend the UGB on its own for a period of time awaiting uh, the next regularly scheduled election and the council would have the benefit both of the completion of the general plan and also the opportunity to do a council-sponsored initiative at a regularly scheduled election. So that's where we are on this topic to date. Thank you. That is the clearest explanation I've heard of this for the several conversations I've been in. So starting with our planning director's memo, thank you for making it clear for us and I appreciate this additional option that's being presented tonight that uh, gives us, a, a, I think, a, a solution to the timing dilemma, the, the environmental review dilemma, all of that. So let's see if there are questions for staff and then we'll go to the public and take comments from the public and bring it back to the council. Any questions of staff? Uh, council members later. Just to verify, um, let's see. do I understand that, that there can be a council initiated extension of the existing UGB? <laughs> yes. Um, it, it, and uh, I think the idea of UGVs was voter approved measures that only the voters could change. So this, which is a very strong way of locking in an urban growth boundary. Uh, and the reason for that uh, was the people promoting these thinking, well, let's make it hard to change these lines. And, because there could be a temptation to do that, city councils change. And so the city council could express a UGD policy by ordinance, yes. But it, it, uh, it, it is not as powerful a tool as a voter approved initiative that only the voters can change. Okay. So the answer to that is yes. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> no, not I, I, you know. I appreciate the explanation. <laughs> um, let's see. That far out be, into 2017 now, the election schedule is a complete unknown. What we were assuming in discussions today that probably if, in the event the council had to extend the UGB by its own action, that you'd probably be looking at a two-year ordinance before you'd be back around again to do a council-sponsored initiative, which is what we theoretically would believe to be your next step. However, you'd have to start that process well in advance. So I think you're looking at about a year of your ordinance being in, in power and then starting the process with a with the council-sponsored initiative looking towards the general election that second year. I.e. 2018. 18. All right. As best we know right now. Operating under the supposition that, that the council 
is sponsoring the, the item on the ballot. That requires CEQA compliance. What level of determination would that be? Is that a full EIR? We have not. Our planning director is the environmental coordinator who makes that initial decision. We staff has not come to a consensus yet on what the level of um, CEQA review would be required. If you're talking about the process where the council adopts the UGB in the fall, for example, by that time we would have the benefit of the general plan EIR or close to it. So we could probably merge the two. And so that's what probably would occur if the council passes a UGB in the fall. Right now, if the council started a council-sponsored initiative today, so we would need to do our own separate CEQA compliance for that. It's a bit unclear, and we have not got a consensus right this minute as to what that would actually entail. I mean, it could be a negative declaration. It could be in the IR. Um, because the council-sponsored initiative is a pretty significant action. That's asking the voters to approve something that's going to be in place for a very long time. And as they reiterate, as the planning director indicated, it's complicated by the fact that the work of the general plan will not yet be done. Mm -hmm. Those two have to be consistent with each other. So if you did a council-sponsored initiative and went to the voters this fall, and the general plan was not yet done, and the voters approve it, that would trump the general plan. So you'd have to go back and make the general plan essentially compliant with the, with the uh, voter-enacted uh, UGB. So that's why this whole subject is so complicated. It depends on what you're trying to do yeah. with the ballot item and when you're trying to do it. So the, the possibility exists that with a council-sponsored <coughs> item, then the sequel review is is automatically required at that point. Can that sequel review be rolled into the EIR for the general plan? Is it is it one and the same review or or it, well let me lay out the calendar as I'm thinking. So the, the general plan, assuming it, it's approved late this year, then the UGB Council sponsored initiative happens the following year, and this is all assuming one app, it could go any number of ways. Can the EIR, or the or rather the uh, the environmental work be done for the initiative at using the general plan environmental work? Yes. Okay. <laughs> yes. So we don't need to. We don't. We don't need to do the same review twice. If it, uh, unless there is some substantial difference between what the general plan sphere is and what the initiative was, that would have to be looked at. But assuming that they were consistent, or there were, there were only minor differences then the general plan EIR, if it had been certified, should be good to serve as the CEQA document for the initiative. Assuming you're talking about an initiative that takes place after preparation yes, exactly. of the general plan exactly. EIR, right. and not one that starts this spring. Right. But that, that Which was, we're not recommending. That okay, was, so I, I have a follow-up to that. This is a timing question, I think. Yeah. And so, uh, if the general plan EIR all of that is done. Sometimes it's going to be late in the fall, which means we miss all the August deadlines and earlier deadlines for a campaign. So we're looking to the following year. How long is that EIR going to be valid for a subsequent council initiative or citizens initiative? 2017, 2018. I'm thinking it's still good in 2018 because that's a recommendation if we need to move this issue to that up that election cycle to save money. Yeah, you do need to look at if, 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 at, if, if looking to see if a prior CEQA document is still valid 
Uh, are there changed circumstances? Uh, like, is the policy substantially different that you're talking about with the initiative? 